Everyone is looking for love. And they're desperate to find it. We must show them love. We must introduce them to love, to Jesus. To Jesus. For this is true revival. Love is all they need. Everlasting love. Rise up and go and show them love, revival love, supernatural love. Jesus is love. love. Welcome to Everlasting Love. My name's Patricia King, and am I ever glad that you've joined me for today's program. I'm going to be introducing to you in a few moments a woman of God whom I deeply respect and honor. Her name is Joy Dawson. I first met her back in 1980 in YWAM when my husband and I and our children went through a DTS. She's a God-fearing woman, a woman who carries weight and authority in the spirit. And at Woman on the Front Lines World Convention at LA, uh, she, she just let her rip. She, she was amazing. And this message, we are privileged to bring some of it to you. So here she is, and I'll see you right after this word. As women on the front lines of the Lord's army, we need to be on the cutting edge of effectiveness. Let's seriously consider some things that would blunt our spiritual sharpness. First, not understanding and applying biblical principles of obedience in our walk with the Lord. Now, one of the most important verses in all of God's Word is 1 Peter 1, verse 2. We are chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. Take note of it, 1 Peter 1, 2. You should know it like John 3, 16, because it's what we're all supposed to be about. And we're going to see that Bible obedience is instant, it's joyful, and it's whole. All else is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Psalm 119, verse 60, King David said, I made haste and did not delay to obey your word. Now, before we go any further, the big deal in relation to obedience and it has to be instant to be uh, Bible obedience, is not what God tells us to do. The big deal was not for that dynamic Deborah to go to India. That wasn't the big deal. It wasn't the big deal for this darling down here to go and be in the prisons. That's not the big deal. It isn't the big deal, as big as it is, that she's going to have re- be used to reform the prisons. That's still not the big deal. So what's the big deal? I wonder if you know. I hope you're asking. I'm glad you did. I'm going to tell you. Our instant obedience is because of who he is who gives the orders. And and I'm going to describe him as I have found him. Now, get this. It's not what you do. You don't write a book because you go to the underground church in China or something, or you go to Africa or India or whatever. That's not it. It's not a big deal what you gave in the offering. Nothing is the big deal other than the person who I'm going to now describe to you this is, this is how I found him to be. This is a description of God, and I just give my testimony. He's supreme in his authority. He's dazzling in his beauty. He's flawless in his character. He's ingenious in his creativity. He's timeless in his existence. He's the most exciting person, unswerving in his faithfulness, matchless in his grace, blazing in his glory, unparalleled in his greatness, awesome in his holiness, 
incomprehensible in his humility. He's the author of humor, the ultimate in intensity. He's absolute in his justice. He's infinite in his knowledge and wisdom. He's unfathomable in his love. He's the fountain of life. He's unending in his mercy. He has totality of ownership. He's limitless in his power. He's fascinating in his personality. He's majestic in his splendor. He's, he's the unquestionable in his sovereignty. He's indescribable in his tenderness. He's the personification of truth. He's unsearchable in his understanding. He's terrible in his wrath. He has an eternal, indestructible kingdom. He's the ruling, reigning monarch of the universe, King God, the lover of my soul, the one who has totally captivated me and the only one who can totally fulfill me. That's my Jesus. And what he tells us to do and to do it instantly is not the big deal. It's who he is. And that's what God wants to take us home out from this incredible dynamic happening. This is a happening. This is a heaven happening. This is not a convention. This is, a, this is God showing up big time. But the big deal who's, is who showed up. And when we understand that, instant obedience is just automatic. God tests us to see if it has become important to us to be obedient to him in the small things before he can trust us to do the big things. Obedience with murmuring is disobedience. <laughs> the children of Israel were in the wilderness but we're in unbelief and murmuring most of the time. And God was totally unimpressed with that kind of obedience. He called it disobedience. We can be positionally right, but conditionally wrong. You, would you say you were in the will of God in this convention? Yes. It, we'll counsel you afterwards if your answer is anything else, but yes. Have you murmured at all since you left home to come here? Would you have said, I'm in the will of God. I'm going to the conference. I'm in the conference. I'm in the will of God. I'm obeying him. You're not. That's called disobedience. Why? Because this is what the, wor the word of God says. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.16-18, to 18, rejoice always. You can't rejoice and murmur at the same time. It's impossible. <laughs> Unless you're a schizophrenic and we'll, we'll, we'll deliver you afterwards. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In my study at home, I have a good-sized framed picture, at least this big, sitting on the wall. And it's the first thing my eye sees every time I walk into my study. And it's a little kitten in a l little tiny basket, no bigger than a, what you'd put little bread, bread rolls in. No bigger than, than that little basket like this, and this little kitten sitting in it, and it's looking up intently, very seriously concentrating. And the caption over the top is, thank you, Lord. That should be our attitude all the time, everywhere, without exception. So don't kid yourself if you're in obedience, and think I'm in obedience, I'm in the will of God, if there's murmuring, you're not, you're out of it. <laughs> Repent and be thankful, and then he'll say, now I'm impressed with you, baby. <laughs> this thing.
thank you all the time with, a, with gratitude puts our focus back on Mr. Big, the one I've been raving about here. <laughs> you thank him that he's in control and will help us. Okay, here comes a blockbuster sentence I never want you to forget. God is always greater than our worst circumstance and there's enough grace for every situation if we want to receive it. Period. <laughs> Partial obedience is disobedience. King Saul disobeyed the prophet Samuel's orders to destroy all God's enemies, the Amalekites, the king and their herd of animals. He kept alive the king and the best of the animals. And then he said very piously to Samuel, oh, I've obeyed, I've done exactly what you told me to do. Wrong. <laughs> we can't compromise or negotiate when the creator of the universe gives us his orders and expect to get away with it. Partial obedience cost King Saul his leadership, his anointing, and, in, and his life. What a price. 1 Samuel 15, 22, behold, to obey instantly, joyfully, wholly, is better than sacrifice for rebellion. This is what God says, unless it's instant, joyful, and whole. He says it's rebellious. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. That's God's, re that's God's description if we're not in instant joyful, whole obedience, all the time. Learned anything? <laughs> okay, so what about when the Holy Spirit prompts us to do something that is totally illogical to our human reasoning, and God doesn't give us any understanding as to its purpose, and we're in front of an audience of believers? Aha! Been there and done that many times. That's my testimony, and, and all heaven is saying, Amen. <laughs> okay, so if we have chosen to be nothing at all times, that He, Jesus, the one I raved about, may be everything, and if we fear the Lord and not men, we will instantly, joyfully, wholly obey Him regardless if we look an idiot and feel like one and we're in front of a whole lot of believers. So I'll give you a story of the many, I could tell you, where God has tested me. I was in, right in Kona, honey, where Patricia King was, sitting in a school of, discipleship school, uh, listening to me teach, right in that very spot where you sat is where my story comes from. I had been teaching, and at the end of the class, I said to God, well, and then said to um, the students in front of me, I haven't known how to apply, how we are to apply this message, and I'm not going to uh, insult God with my stupid little pea-sized mind of suggestions how we, uh, make application, so I need to seek the Lord. So I said, that's what I'm going to do. He'll tell us how this message is to be applied. I waited on God, and I heard him say, lie on your face on the floor. <laughs> I said to the people, the Holy Spirit just said, lie on your face on the floor. I did. I lay there for 15 minutes. I timed it. It seemed, <laughs> it seemed like 15 hours, but it was 15 minutes. No explanation, nothing. I'm just obeying the lover of my soul. At the end of 15 minutes, and I was as relaxed as a poached egg, just lying there on my face on the floor. And then, and then mercifully, my lover said to me, now, get up 
and tell them to do whatever I tell them. I'd just done whatever he told me. It was their turn. I didn't, get, I never embellished it. You don't need to embellish God's voice. I see people doing it in plap, uh, on pulpits all the time. It's so boring. <laughs> just do what he tells you to do. Shut up and just do, get on with it. So all I said, do whatever he tells you to do. That's all. I am here as a witness, and so is all the angels in heaven and God on his throne. In the next hour, because I timed it again, <laughs> as one by one stood with great humility and declared a significant spiritual need or an emotional need, whatever it was, they weren't whole and they needed help and they had to humble themselves because he said, do whatever I told you to do. And he was just telling them to, to get up and declare some need in their life in front of the whole classroom. As they did, then um, myself and uh, a couple of others would move in and we would pray for that need to be met. I'm telling you, marriages of married couples who've come to that school that were uh, cross purposes with one another, marriages were healed, there was physical healings of bodies as they got up and said they were ill or there was emotional healings there was a mighty move of God's spirit for a whole hour and it went right through the lunchtime, that's how you know they were real in that room <laughs> they gave up lunchtime and that move of God's spirit would have never taken place if I hadn't just instantly joyfully, wholly obeyed the next little thing he told me to do that made me look like a nut. <laughs> and I don't mean even a good macadamia one. <laughs> now, Jesus is our role model. Jesus is our role model. Let's all say it together. Jesus is our role model. We can have lots of mentors. There's only one role model. It's the Son of God. He only did what he heard and saw what God his Father said and did. John 8, 28. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Verse 38. I speak what I have seen with my Father. So... When God the Father told Jesus to pick up little kids and take them in his arms and bless them, that was no more important to Jesus than when God the Father says, speak out with a bold, loud voice and look into the, to the great big stone there that, with Lazarus behind it and say, Lazarus, come forth. But which, which was, was one deal bigger than the other? No. Just taking up the little children and putting them in his arms was just as important because of who it is who gives the order, not what he tells you to do. Is it coming through? <laughs> if we don't have this perspective and live by it, we'll lose our cutting edge of effectiveness. Women on the front lines. This is a message on getting the cutting edge on our effectiveness. And that can be absolutely disastrous if you're out in the front lines, because if you're out in the front lines, you're leading. And that means you have great influence. And that means you have greater accountability because you're out front. You better have your razor sharp. We'd better be effective because the greater the responsibility in leadership, the more accountable we are to God. And that's why James uh, chapter 3 says, Be not many teachers, my brethren, for, or sistren, because we who teach shall be judged with greater strictness. Why does God say that? Ever stop to think about it? Why, judge the Why does God judge the leaders greater? He doesn't want to multiply phonies. And that's why. And leadership, leadership have the greater influence, 
and he wants only reality to be uh, mo uh, modeled. You do if Jesus is your model. Psalm 1913, another extremely important scripture. Underline it if you're taking notes. Put stars around it. <laughs> this is how King David prayed near at, at the end of his life. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. What we think is just a little thing? Oh, well, I can just presume. I don't have to check in. I can just presume. Oh, no, you can't. Not and get away with it with God. And that's why God has it in the word. Presumption, great transgression, a major sin in God's sight. And unfortunately, the realism is it's all also one of the most prevalent sins in the body of Christ, period. How does it work? By not seeing our need to seek God's will before making decisions, small and large. Jesus didn't. Jesus is our model. He only did what he saw and heard the Father say, John 8:26. John 12, 49, I have not spoken on my own authority. The Father who sent me has himself given me commandment, what to say and what to speak. Jesus gave the Father listening time as a way of life. Do you know how I live all the time? All the time, no matter where I am. I have one ear out here, listening. Have you anything to say at any moment? And then I've the other here listening to what's going on around me. I don't give you my full attention. I give you half because my other ear is listening to what the Holy Spirit's saying. <laughs> Why? Because I'm in, many strokes for me? No. I just happen to have made Jesus the model, my model. How does presumption manifest itself? When praying for others, what do you do? Just pray off the top of your head? Automatically pray in tongues? Or when praying for others, do you have the humility to wait in God's presence and listen to the Holy Spirit before you open your sweet little mouth to say any words at all? Romans 8, 26, we don't know how to pray as we ought. Well, that should be enough right there. But then it goes on to say, but the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We've had the bad news, now we've got the good news. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. So why don't we wait on God and let the Holy Spirit tell us how to pray for somebody that's, that's in front of us? Do we move in presumption and do our own pathetic thing? And we may be very impressed with the prayer that comes out of our mouth. And you could miss completely what the Holy Spirit wanted to say to you and through you for that person. I have received numerous, very significant directions given to me by the Holy Spirit as I've made it an absolute way of life not to open my mouth at all and say a word when I'm praying for another until the Holy Spirit gives it to me. The, I, and I thought as I was preparing this message, I thought, goodness, I could write a book just on the things that have happened. Incredible, amazing revelations, things that have affected masses of, of people, people groups, because I didn't pray off the top of my head, I waited and listened. Sometimes it isn't a prayer at all. It's a revelation or a prophetic word or scriptures or whatever. Okay, so what about when counseling others? You've got the people in front of you. Oh, and you may have your counseling degrees and all that. <laughs> the ultimate counselor, the Holy Spirit is within you. He's got more degrees than anybody could come up with and, and infinitely more, much more wisdom. 
Do you know how I've learned to counsel? I mean, the most complex cases. I can tell you. They come in front of me. I mean, they're a complete basket case, a mess. See, all right. I just sit them down and I say, don't look at me. I've, I've, I've got no wisdom of myself at all, none. Look to him. He's made unto me wisdom. But it's him. Don't look to me. Look at him. And I have nothing to share with you or counsel with you today, not a word to tell you, until and unless he gives it to me. And I may have to wait half an hour, because he may test not just me, but you, baby, because, because I won't say a word till I get what he tells me. Radical? You bet it is. But this is how Jesus lived to the Father. The most radical being that ever lived was the Son of God. He never said an independent thing from, from what he heard the Father. And do you, know that the, the, do you know that it's the great big stone of unbelief that has to be rolled away before you can believe that the counselor will tell you what to say and what to do in his time? They believe I've got the answers, but they don't believe I'll come through and tell them. Who gets all the glory at the end of the counseling session when the person's been set free? The only one who did the talk, who give the, was the only one giving the directions. I'm just the little messenger girl listening to hear what he says and delivering the goods. Whenever I am in the presence of Joy Dawson and her preaching, truly the conviction and the fear of the Lord, the beautiful, beautiful fear of the Lord comes upon me. It pulls me up into a place of wanting to align completely with the Lord himself. Is that how this message impacted you? I hope so. Bring your heart before him. Align your heart with him and move forward in these coming days with a new level of consecration for the Lord, for his glory, and for his kingdom. And above all, remember this, that God loves you with an everlasting love. He really does. Let that love transform you. We'll see you next time. And in the meantime, meet me online at patriciaking.com.